Vegas has a way of bringing out the sin of the Sin City in some people. They met in high school and they fell in love. He had all these kids. He had this wife. He fought in Iraq. He's a proud American patriot. The two together was a deadly mix. We simply didn't see it. My investigator was a former police officer for 30 years, and he said, oh, how could this woman have been involved in this? The people in Vegas who do this sort of thing can easily pick out a mark in the crowd, and she certainly became one. Maybe it was his Rico Suave attitude towards her. Maybe she saw that he was somebody who had more money than her own husband. It was a death trial, and it proceeded to be a death penalty case. It couldn't be more horrific. The kids all heard the screams. Where there's secrets, there's lies. And where there's lies, and there's jealousy, and there's rage, there's what? Murder. So Nathan Payette and Michelle Payette grew up in Guam. They're both from Guam, which is a United States territory. Michelle meets Nathan in high school, and they're high school sweethearts. And it's kind of one of those storybook romances, if you will. Michelle was an absolutely stunning, beautiful woman and she definitely had the absolute image of a beautiful island girl. Long, beautiful, dark hair. And I could see how Nathan and any guy in her age group, she would have attracted their attention. Michelle was the apple of Nathan's eye. He was absolutely in love with her. Since the moment he saw her, he knew that this is the girl that he wanted to marry. They stay together. He joins the Air Force. And before they know it, they have four kids. Nathan was uh, deployed a couple of times. Michelle had stopped working and was raising the family while Nathan was away. They had moved over to the United States, to the mainland, uh, with the military, and they had previously lived in Alaska and Arizona, uh, and they had settled in Las Vegas. While most Americans only experience war through movies like American Sniper and The Hurt Locker, Fighting on the front lines was an all-too-familiar reality for Nathan Payette. After Nathan returned home, he was stationed at the Nellis Air Force Base in Las Vegas, Nevada. By 2010, Michelle and Nathan had been living in Las Vegas for three years, and their four children were between the ages of two and nine. So Las Vegas is the entertainment capital of the world. And any time you talk to people from uh, other parts of the country or the world, and you let them know you live in Las Vegas, they think you live in a casino, you live in a hotel. I mean, that's the image that people have of Las Vegas. It's definitely an up from their humble beginnings in Guam. You have a downtown area, you have shopping centers, you have neighborhoods. And in this particular case, the Payettes were living in a very nice middle-class neighborhood in the southwest part of uh, the Las Vegas Valley. But really, it's not a lavish lifestyle. It's just that they're content. He was incredibly committed to his wife, incredibly committed to his family. He drops his kids off at the school in the morning, takes care of them when they come home, goes to work at night. He's just being a father and a husband, doing the best he can. Everyone loved Michelle Pyatt as well. And everyone looked at Michelle and Nathan as being the perfect couple. It was December the 1st. The Thanksgiving holidays were already behind them and now going back to the routine before Christmas came up. Michelle had gone to work. She checked in at about 5 o'clock, but by 5.30 she clocked out claiming that she was not feeling good and that she was going to go home. So she came home early and uh, she ended up spending the evening with her children, with Nathan, resting before he had to leave for work. Nathan was scheduled to start work at 11.30 at night at the Air Force Base, and he always uh, had the late night shift, and he worked all the way till 8 o'clock in the morning. Suddenly, Nathan realized he was running late, and he started uh, getting dressed real quickly because he had to report at 11.30. 
He got up and immediately called uh, his co-worker saying, hey, I'm sorry, I'm going to be late. I'll be there uh, hopefully at 12 o'clock, so don't worry about me, I'm on my way. Nathan gets ready for work, puts his uniform on, walks out the door and into the garage. He immediately opened the garage door. And this is where everything changes. He suddenly realized that two individuals were approaching him. These two individuals were armed. We don't know if, if something was said, but immediately gunfire blasted. Nathan is shot five times in the back. He's on the garage floor. He's still alive. And Nathan, all what he could do at that point was think about running back into the house and protect his family. He finds the strength within him to crawl up the steps into the door. He actually collapsed on the floor with his children screaming, watching their father die uh, while wearing his Air Force uniform. And he, his death was slowly happening in front of their eyes because he was bleeding to death. They call 911. They try and resuscitate him. The moment 911 call was placed, uh, police were also dispatched. And the first responding officers were some patrol officers that approached the home, uh, not knowing whether or not the uh, assailants, the shooters, are still present in the house or outside the house. Uh, a couple of patrol officers slowly approach the residence, and one makes contact with Michelle and realizes that there was an Air Force man in a uniform that was dying and immediately summoned the ambulance services to proceed to the residence in order to take him to see if there was anything that could still be done. He's rushed to the hospital while Michelle is going absolutely crazy. She's hysterical. The kids are crying. It's just a chaotic scene. At the hospital, Nathan is pronounced dead. 28-year-old Air Force veteran, dead. Maybe it was just a random shooting, murder, possibly home invasion gone wrong and the person panicked. Perhaps it was mistaken identity. There's multiple questions here without any answers. Police begin to interview family and friends and neighbors and it's like Nathan, he has no enemies. They're clueless. What the hell happened here? Here's a Air Force veteran going to work, murdered in his own garage. Who could have done this? You know, we think that we don't have enemies, but there's someone out there who doesn't like us. Investigation. Nathan Payet decided to join the United States Air Force. That took him to different parts of the world, not just staying in Guam. He also married Michelle, and eventually they settled here in the Las Vegas Valley when Nathan was stationed at the Nellis Air Force Base, which is a major Air Force base on the far northeast corner of the Las Vegas Valley. For someone coming from a small village, per se, in Guam, to now America on steroids, Vegas, Boy, what a shock that must have been. Nathan bought a house in the southwest part of uh, Las Vegas in a brand new neighborhood, but the house came with a mortgage and certainly that uh, probably put some constraints on the family. Nathan was an absolute outstanding individual. There has not been one single person that said a single bad word. So Nathan is working second shift, gets his uniform on, gets himself ready to leave that night. This is where that happy white picket fence life becomes, well, I don't know, tinged with red, maybe. He was executed walking out of his garage. She places the 911 call saying that something horrific happened, that she doesn't know what happened, and she's calling for help for the police to arrive. She also is getting instructions through 911 operator on how to do CPR, uh, but to no avail. One of those shots was so fatal that even paramedics, if they rushed in time, could not have saved Nathan Payette. 
here's Nathan lying on the floor in a pool of blood in his military fatigues. He died in front of his four children. Extremely sad. Michelle is just devastated. And you have to understand, good individuals, people who are in the Air Force, who live in middle-class neighborhoods, don't just get shot in the front of their homes as they're leaving to go to work. It just doesn't happen. So for these homicide detectives, they're puzzled because this is out of the ordinary. As investigators canvass the neighborhood, they run into a neighbor. Right at the time of the gunshots rang out, and seconds later, there happened to be a couple of homeowners that were walking in the darkness of the streets. And the neighbor says, yeah, you know, here I am, I'm walking down the street, it's nighttime, peaceful, I'm walking my dog, and I hear these loud pops, gunfire. What was what you saw in the evening of December 1st? The neighbor, Jameson Bauman, reported that the neighborhood was dark, calm, and quiet when suddenly he heard the startling gunshots. Bauman then saw a dark-colored sedan, thought to have been a Cadillac, speed out of the neighborhood. The driver of the vehicle quickly turned off the headlights after fleeing the scene. Okay, what happened next? Uh, Eventually, homicide detectives approached and started talking to uh, Michelle. Police, of course, come to the hospital and they take a statement from Michelle. When we heard the noise, we arrived to check on it. She somewhat lost her identity as she was a mother and a wife and no identity beyond that. And she was looking for employment out of the house to supplement their income. And she was working out of the house at this time. Michelle was working, but she wasn't necessarily working uh, in high paying jobs. And one of the reasons that was causing some struggles in the relationship is that Nathan wanted her to get a better paying job. Nathan himself was struggling to make all the ends meet with his Air Force uh, salary, but he was also moonlighting as a security guard uh, when he was not working. So she was working uh, part time or working during the day and then at night time she would go to classes because the family needed the resources. And so the detectives, knowing this information, they asked Michelle, were you guys having problems? And they, you know, were you having an extramarital affair or anything like that? And she denied it. But then when she was asked, do you know anybody who owns a Cadillac or a dark colored sedan? She suddenly piped up and says, oh yeah, a guy that I work with by the name of Michael Rodriguez. One of the first things investigators do today is check phone records, you know? because phone records begin to tell a tale. And they look at Nathan's phone records, and they find nothing. Then they look at Michelle's, and apparently Michelle has a big secret. Michelle had been working at a telemarketing company in Vegas, and there in the office, she meets Michael Rodriguez. Yeah, I know. Uh which the detectives found very interesting because she had given the detectives consent to let them look into her phone and notice that she had been texting a Michael Rodriguez just minutes before the homicide. And so that certainly piqued law enforcement's interest. There must be a connection with Michelle Payette and Michael Rodriguez that they needed to explore a little bit more. So the phone records reveal that, unbeknownst to family and friends, and definitely Nathan, Michelle was getting a little bored with the suburban, content, housewife life. Michael Rodriguez was the typical salesperson. Uh, it was a telephone room type job, and he was the master salesperson, the manipulative, sweet-talking salesperson and could say all the right things. What sound your voice? He started bringing her her favorite CD, noticing her favorite songs and bringing her the CD of it, bringing her coffee in the morning, um, bringing her her favorite lunch, uh, and just started paying attention to her. And Michelle liked the attention he was paying her. And that led to a kind of a flirtation. But the flirtation ended up into a, a little bit more, into a friendship. Apparently they hit it off because she starts an affair with this guy. You know, and the affair has been going on for like six months and it's passionate, it's hot, 
It's new, and she's loving it because Rodriguez is kind of a, he's a player, you know? He's, he's the bad boy that her husband wasn't. And while Nathan never did anything wrong and nobody could ever say anything bad about Nathan, he also never said, Michelle, your hair looks great today. Michelle, can I get you coffee? Hey, Michelle, let's go to lunch. He never complimented her either. The homicide detectives then turned their attention to this Michael Rodriguez. Since he was the one person that Michelle was texting with just minutes before the homicide, and he happens to own a car that could possibly match a black sedan that was seen racing out of the neighborhood shortly after the gunshots rang out. When we look at Michael Rodriguez, we see a two-time felon. The guy's a criminal. The guy's been involved with things that Michelle, certainly Nathan, has probably not even thought of. Yet here she is running around town with this guy. She's attracted to that and she's attracted to the freshness of the relationship and that euphoric feeling you have with a new relationship, she loves it. Michelle's affair with Michael was able to thrive really because Nathan worked at night. So they could really carry on and carry on as long as they wanted to while Nathan was at work. But one thing this did to Michelle was she wanted more. She saw Michael Rodriguez as like her life. This guy was gonna just sweep me off my feet and take me into the next dream. That's when the talk of if we are together started. Investigation. Michelle and Nathan were a family of six. It was a military family, so they had moved all around. Uh, they were originally from the island of Guam. From my understanding, most individuals that live in Guam, they want to get off the island and uh, see the world. Michelle was also looking for a better life. And I think eventually when she decided to marry Nathan, and by marrying Nathan, since he was in the Air Force, took her outside of Guam. They were high school sweethearts, and they were just one big family all living together. He's a guy that is just chasing that American dream every day, and it's literally coming true for him, or so he thinks. You know, here we have a guy in the Air Force. He could be shot out of the sky. He could crash his jet. He could be shot by another soldier. But what happens? He's killed, and he dies, not on the battlefield, but in front of his four children. Go to your room. The police start their investigations and they were led to Michelle's phone records and the communications that she was having in her text messages. There's just one bombshell after the next being dropped. Nathan didn't cheat on her, but he didn't pay her much attention either. And Michael Rodriguez did. Here is Michelle. She's having these sexual rendezvous in the back of Rodriguez's car, all over town. I think it was naivety. Maybe that was from living on the small island of Guam and growing up on the small island of Guam and never meeting anyone like Michael Rodriguez. Michael is the target of this investigation. I mean, once investigators find out she's having an affair, the boyfriend has to be the number one suspect. So they drove over to EIM, the location where the business was located at, and sure enough, the first thing that they spot was a black Cadillac sedan that matched the description of the car that was given by the homeowners that was seen racing out of the neighborhood. Homicide detectives then called in patrol officers to pull him over so that they could stop and talk to him. They asked him if he would consent to come to the police station so that he can uh, interview. Michael Rodriguez voluntarily underwent police interrogation. He denied having a relationship with Michelle Payette and claimed to have an alibi at the time of Nathan Payette's murder. Rodriguez stated that he was with another woman at the time named Shannon Saliot, an ex-porn star, who he claimed he'd just met that day. He claimed that he took her to a, a local casino called the Suncoast. 
proceeded to get a room and had sex with this porn star the entire night. Well, this story, as the homicide detectives were listening to it, it just sounded unbelievable. And they just didn't um, take it full hook, line, and sinker. The homicide detectives clearly had to find out, okay, well, who's Shannon Sally? They did proceed to go find Shannon. They found her working at a local um, art gallery, and they did a quick interview. And she said, yeah, I was with Michael Rodriguez, and I had sex with him, and we were at this hotel that night. Yeah, we went to the hotel. They went to the surveillance individuals that worked for the Suncos. They spoke to um, the head uh, surveillance guy, and they went through the timeline of what Michael Rodriguez uh, gave them. He was there, but he actually showed up uh, slightly after midnight, not when he stated. And so immediately the homicide detectives realized that his story wasn't panning out and the alibi that Shannon gave to the detective when she was approached is not adding up either because their time was way off. Homicide detectives were on the right track, but new further investigation was warranted to figure out why Michael Rodriguez would lie about his whereabouts the night of Nathan Payette's murder. Now that they had actually concrete physical evidence, surveillance video showing that he um, had not uh, provided him with truthful information, they reapproached uh, Michelle and they said they wanted to come talk to her. I just need to go over a few things. On uh, December the 7th, she shows up to the prearranged agreed meeting to be interviewed. She had never been in trouble before in her entire life. She was sweet, kind, caring, meek, gentle, not manipulative. She couldn't say a bad word about Nathan. She could say nothing but I love Nathan. She loved her children. She loved her life. She loved Nathan's family. She loved her family. She had everything going for her. They had everything going for them. Let's start with December 1st. The interrogation begins and she cracks. I was cheating with Nathan. She ended up breaking down and confessing to the police everything that happened. I'm sorry. She begins to talk about the affair. Michael Rodriguez was paying attention to her and saying, what if we were together? What if your husband wasn't there? Don't you stand again if your husband was injured while he was deployed? Don't you have life insurance? And Michelle would answer the questions, yes. I would. We have life insurance. The military provides us with life insurance, so on and so forth. Michelle starts talking about how, yeah, with the military, I, I was going to get $400,000 if he died. And then she had another life insurance policy on Nathan that was worth another quarter million. So we're talking $650,000 here. Well, when Rodriguez found that out, of course, that's what his eyes were set on. And he wanted his share of that. And she promised him $150,000 to carry out this murder. Michelle Payette was not happy at the time living in Las Vegas. She was very unhappy with, I guess, living in the desert. Michelle might have been bored with Vegas. She wanted out of there, but she just didn't have the money. So huh, she created a way to get that cash she admitted to the murder for her hire. She admitted to the amount of money that she would be receiving. And she basically laid all out. Here's a problem with paying someone $150,000 for a murder. Now it's become a murder for hire. And murder for hire in any state is a capital felony, punishable by the death penalty. I think that's everything that we need for today. Interestingly enough, the uh, homicide detectives played a psychological game with her and just basically says, okay, you're, you're free to go for now. And they let her go. Michelle was sitting on the curb saying that she just wanted to kill herself, that she wanted to throw herself in the traffic. She came from Guam with Nathan to Vegas four kids start this life she runs into this guy at work thinks she's going to have this affair and he's going to sweep her off her feet next thing she knows she's wrapped up in a murder michelle realizes that her world has just exploded because 
she realizes she's been manipulated by this guy that she thought was everything to her, right? So what does she do? She decides she's going to take her own life. She can't deal with the pain. Investigation. Michael Rodriguez worked Michelle Pyatt, and he worked her all in the right ways. He manipulated Michelle Pyatt. The ironic thing in this case is that Nathan, as well as he tried to take care of himself when he was out in a war zone, nobody ever would have imagined that he would come to his own death in the sanctity of his home in a very decent neighborhood. He was shot multiple times, but one shot was fatal that hit a carotid artery and uh, he basically bled to death. They heard the shots being fired, and then they saw the Cadillac zoom out of the neighborhood. So they pretty quickly linked the Cadillac to Michael Rodriguez. Why she would do it, I don't know. But he is extremely manipulative. So he says, bring me the life insurance policy, and she brings the life insurance policy. Show me this, and, he, and she does it. Why she does it, I don't know. But she does it, and that's bad. And she sends the text messages, and that's bad. But... They didn't need the money. She was happy. Just, there's no explanation. But again, you're also dealing with the scoundrel Michael Rodriguez. I mean, this guy, smooth-talking, silver-tongued individual, um, I'm sure he um, probably did a number on her. With a light shined in Michelle's face at the precinct, she immediately cracks. You know, all of us, um, our investigator, uh, me as lead counsel and my co-counsel, we all said, how, how can someone like this have gotten involved in this? Michelle is on suicide watch. Michelle ended up going into a psychiatric hospital. She had a nervous breakdown after she was interviewed by the police. Homicide detectives called 911 themselves in order to have um, Michelle checked out mentally and make sure that she was mentally still present in order to proceed. On December 9th, 2010, police had enough evidence against Michelle Payette to issue a warrant for her arrest on suspicion of murder with a deadly weapon, conspiracy to commit murder, and conspiracy to commit burglary. The arrest came just eight days after Nathan's murder and on the same day as his body was returned to Guam, where he was born. Michelle was held at the Clark County Detention Center. I was called for representation of Michelle Pyatt, and I immediately went over and I met her at the jail right after she was arrested. And I have been with Michelle Pyatt ever since uh, this occurred, ever since the day she was arrested and brought into custody. So the four kids, ages two through nine, are taken into protective custody. Now we have four young children without a father and really without a mother. I mean, that must be devastating for family members. While in custody, Michelle is interrogated. And what she has to say is shocking, beyond belief. She begins to talk about how heated it was. Then she begins to talk about a plot to get rid of Nathan for two months before he was murdered. This was a premeditated, well-planned murder. And Michelle was involved. You know, one of the coldest factors of this is while Michelle laid in bed next to Nathan, while he slept so he could work the next day, she's coming up with different scenarios and plots to discuss with Michael Rodriguez in order to kill him. One of those involved something out of like the movie Casino, where he would be blindfolded, put in a car, driven out to the desert, tortured, and then murdered. We'll do this when the time is right. When they thought maybe that was too much, then they developed this plan. Hey, you know what? He goes to work every time this night. He steps out that door. Just wait in the bushes, come out, kill him, and go. And that's exactly what happened. 
Michelle came home and had indicated that she wasn't feeling well and told her husband that she had to go to the hospital or that she was sick. And so she turned off Nathan's phone so his alarm wouldn't wake him up in order to get to work that night. And she sent a text message saying he overslept, it's called off or something to that extent. And she sent it to Michael Rodriguez. She thought that text message was calling the whole thing off, meaning that this would never happen. So Michael Rodriguez apparently was still outside with Corey Hawkins, who Michelle Pyatt has never met, never had a word with, has never laid eyes on this Corey Hawkins. Corey Hawkins was an individual that was uh, befriended uh, by Michael Rodriguez. Both of them met at the Nevada State Prison when both of them were serving prison sentences together. It was Michael who approached Corey to see if Corey wanted to assist him and help him with this homicide. And he was supposed to get a split of the life insurance. Michael Rodriguez had set up some elaborate alibi after the murder occurred. That he met up with Shannon Selliott. She was an ex-porn star. They met at the hotel. They had a room reserved for them. I think they even filmed themselves so that he would be on camera with her. Somehow, he was going to use this as evidence to say that he was not at the crime scene, that he was, in fact, at this hotel with Shannon instead. Typical of Michael Rodriguez, he's trying to minimize, tries to say, well, you know, it wasn't really me. He tries to pin it on his friend, Corey Hawkins and basically encouraging the homicide detectives to go and find Corey Hawkins because he's a bad person. What the phone records, the texts especially, reveal is that two more co-conspirators, Jessica Austin and Corey Hawkins, boyfriend and girlfriend, who not only helped with the murder, but helped to hide and conceal evidence. So now we have what? We have a conspiracy to kill this guy that's involving definitely three people with possibly a fourth. It was Corey Hawkins' girlfriend who kind of planted the seed in Shannon to see if she could be an alibi in case something went wrong. If you met Shannon, I think you're dealing with a troubled young lady. She was an attractive young lady, but she clearly made mistakes. And I think she probably made those mistakes just because she was not thinking things through. And uh, she may have been in a part in their time of her life where she was vulnerable and susceptible to agreeing to do things that um, maybe most normal people would never have done. Like I said, it all goes back to how manipulative Michael Rodriguez is and what a player he is and how he can just connect the dots and use these women as he wishes for whatever master scheme that he has. When we look at Corey and Jessica, you know, we don't see two uh, naive individuals who just got wrapped up in some murder plot. We see two criminals with rap sheets, two people who are players in Vegas who have gotten around. The homicide detectives then immediately raced out with the information that they learned from Michelle and they grabbed Michael Rodriguez. They arrested him. Initially, Michael Rodriguez decided to say nothing. He indicated that he had no clue what this is all about, and but he was booked for murder, and he knew it because he was told by the homicide detectives and that he was facing now life without the possibility of parole if he were to be convicted, and possibly the death sentence because it was murder for hire, and that was always a possible penalty for the charge that he was facing. The very next day, Michael Rodriguez calls the homicide detectives to come back to the jail, that he wanted to be a little bit more forthright and start telling more information. Money is absolutely the motive in this case. So it was a significant case that uh, needed to be prosecuted. It was important to the uh, members of our community and certainly was important for every Air Force man uh, out there knowing that one of their own was killed by his spouse, all for financial gains. What we have is some really seedy Las Vegas, dark back alley criminals, and we have a porn star, and then we have a murdered Air Force veteran. Gee, what could go wrong with that plot to murder this guy? 
everything. She started planting the seed about all the life insurance that Nathan had on his life. And when she started talking about the amount of money that was on his life, uh, that certainly perked the ear of a Michael Rodriguez. It was a significant amount of money. Keep in mind, Nathan was an Air Force man, and he had served time in Afghanistan and Iraq, and so the amount of life insurance that he had on him certainly speaks volumes for the type of person that Nathan was, because in the case that something were to have happened to him while he was deployed overseas in war zones, he wanted to make sure that his family was taken care of. So Michelle Pyatt had known Michael Rodriguez from work, Michael Rodriguez had a conversation with Michelle Pyatt. Michael Rodriguez goes and meets with his friends, Corey and Jessica, and they have a separate conversation and scheme or devise this whole plan to get rid of Nathan Pyatt. Shannon Saliot says she had just met Michael the day before the murder. And who introduced her to Michael? Well, that was Corey and Jessica. And what was she told? You're going to be paid to create an alibi for Michael so he can rob a heroin dealer. It sounds good. But when that heroin dealer turned into a respected father of four army veteran, the stakes were changed. Because then Shannon became very fearful that she was the next to be murdered. Homicide detectives then, with the information that they learned, proceeded to get a search warrant for the residents of uh, uh, Jessica Austin and uh, Corey Hawkins. Uh, they found both individuals there. They certainly tied Corey Hawkins into the homicide, as was Jessica Austin. And she was also tied in as an accessory to the murder, being a co-conspirator throughout this uh, scheme that involved the individuals that Michael Rodriguez put into play at the encouragement of Michelle Payette. On the night of December the 1st, Shannon was at the apartment with Jessica waiting for Corey and Michael Rodriguez to come back. The moment they walked into the apartment, both Corey and Michael immediately stripped down the clothing that they were wearing. They burned the clothing in a fireplace at the apartment. Then they changed clothing into new clothing. Michael Rodriguez immediately yelled at Shannon to get her stuff and that they needed to go. Shannon dutifully got into the car with Michael Rodriguez and they proceeded to race over to the Sun Coast where they are ultimately seen arriving sometime after midnight, booking into a room, uh, stopping at an ATM, getting some cash and proceeding up to the bedroom where they proceed to have sex. So we have Corey, Jessica, Michael, Michelle, all put in jail, no bail possible. I was the chief of homicide for the Clark County District Attorney's Office, and this case was uh, suddenly uh, assigned to me for the prosecution. It was a high-profile case. Michael Rodriguez is this smooth-talking criminal who can manipulate women. You know, he's a party guy. He gets what he wants. And when he saw Michelle, boy, he saw a piece of clay that he could shape and mold into whatever he wanted and she would not have a clue as to what's going on. For five years, Michael awaits trial, but when trial comes, it takes the jury two hours, and they probably had lunch in between that to convict him, and he's sentenced to life in prison, potentially facing the death penalty next. After his conviction on a charge of first-degree murder in September 2015, and on the verge of a hearing where he faced the death penalty, Michael Rodriguez agreed to serve life in prison without the possibility of parole or appeal in order to avoid the death sentence. One month later, Corey Hawkins, a nine-time convicted felon, also pled guilty to murder and burglary charges to avoid the death penalty. On September 20th, 2016, Corey Hawkins was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Jessica pled guilty to conspiracy to commit murder. You can't hide anything anymore. During Michelle's trial, it all comes out. The phone records, the texts, the six-month affair, but most importantly, the plan and the plot to murder her husband. One of the most shocking things to come out of this 
was a text message that Michelle sends to Michael. Quote, he's rushing to get out of the door, LOL, end quote. And what's really sad about that is Michelle probably wrote that text message in front of her children. I believed in the death penalty until I've met people who were facing the death penalty and I've worked with these people um, and now I'm against it. And when you see these jurors so willing and ready to vote for death on these individuals, because it's the only case that they're going to hear on, um, it gave us a cold reality check and it gave Michelle a cold reality check and she was scared. Michelle ultimately pleads guilty to avoid the death penalty. We were hopeful that we could possibly get Michelle Pyatt life with the possibility of parole after spending a significant amount of time in prison. And that significant amount of time would have made it so that her children would have already reached the age of majority by the time she was released. It was in the court's hands and it was up to the judge to sentence her. She is sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Michelle and Nathan's children, when this happened, were all between the ages of 2 to 11. Right around there, they were all very young. They were old enough to remember. It's very sad. It must have been a horrific scene for these children to have that memory cemented in their minds and their for the rest of their lives, and knowing that their very own mother set this up for their father. There wasn't one victim in this case. It was five and four of them were children. They'll be traumatized for life. They're being raised by Nathan's parents. I am one of the few attorneys in the state of Nevada uh, that does pardons cases. And um, in the state of Nevada, if you receive life without the possibility of parole, um, you cannot go before the pardons board to get pardoned. So there is nothing I can do for Michelle Pyatt. There is nothing. After a while, is the 50 km per hour speed control section. There is a speed bump on the front. <laughs> 